welcome to worship on this first Sunday of the Lenten season. My name is Reverend Melanie Marsh Baum, and I am the senior pastor here at Community Presbyterian Church. And whether this is your first day visiting with us, whether you have been a long time member, whether you came into worship this morning excited to be here with your church family, or whether you are still trying to figure out whether or not you belong here at all, Worship today is different and special because you are here. And we are so glad that you have joined us with worship. Today, we could not do this without you. In this season of Lent, we have many things going on in the life of our church that I want to share with you and hope that you will take part in. But today, I want to highlight just a couple of those for you. This season of Lent, we are inviting all everyone in our community to um, partake in any way that they feel comfortable in our Lent Unplugged uh, practice that we are taking on. This is a way for us to find connections in the real world with one another. We have just come through and many of us are still living in a time when connection face to face has been challenging if not impossible. And we've all come to rely heavily on digital forms of communication and connection with one another. And while those will always have a place in our modern day life and world, in this season we are looking for ways to maybe sacrifice or fast from some of those digital forms of communication and find ways to bring in practices of connecting with one another face to face, heart to heart, and spirit to spirit. And a couple of ways that we can do that from our community right here um, in the beaches and at Community Presbyterian Church is by taking part in some of the events that we have happening here. One of those this morning is our Come to the Table event that is taking place right outside the church offices. We have tables set up where you can look and see all of the ways that you can get involved as a volunteer, in small groups, in our mission projects, and we hope that you will take a walk through that space right after worship and talk with some of the people who are there representing our missions and volunteer opportunities and maybe sign up or commit to a group that you want to take part in for a season or for longer. We are also having a couple of weekly events that take place throughout the season of Lent. We're hosting a video watching group for the video series, The Chosen. It's being hosted at Cindy Anderson's home on Tuesday nights at 645. And we're also hosting a weekly Thursday morning and afternoon beach movement class. This is going to be no music, no heavy choreography, just people gathering to move together by the ocean to the sounds of nature. I will be hosting this event. It's open to all ages all skill levels, all comfort levels with motion and movement. Um, and you're welcome to join us at 8.30 a.m. or 4.30 p.m. on Thursdays. We are also in the month of March, and those of you who are basketball fans know all about March Madness. Well, you will be hearing a little bit about later on in our worship service about something we're practicing this year at our church called March Music Madness. So listen out for that later on. My final word of reminder and announcement this morning before we begin our worship service is that next week begins daylight savings time. I know it might feel like it's too early for that to be happening, but we will spring forward one hour next week, and we hope you will set your clocks ahead so that you can join us at the right time for worship, and we will all be here together. Um, we will be doing, throughout the season of Lent, some new or returning liturgy in our worship services. I know it may be hard to remember way back before COVID, we used to have spoken calls to worship, spoken confessions, some spoken liturgy within our communion services. So as we go through the worship service today, please make sure you keep an eye on your bulletin so that you can follow along with all the spoken parts that are returning in our liturgy for worship this morning. With all of these things in our hearts and our minds as we prepare for worship this morning, I invite you to join with me in the call to worship that is printed in your bulletin. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, 
heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Our opening hymn this morning is number 441, Take Time to Be Holy. Please stand as you are able and join with me in singing. may be seated. As we move throughout the season of Lent and throughout all of our lives, we are reminded of just how much God wishes for us and expects of us, and just how far we fall from the mark at times in our lives. And yet we are grateful and confident in the knowledge of that we serve a God of mercy. And so with this knowledge in our hearts, let us confess together using the confession that is printed in your bulletin. O oh God, every time we look at our lives, we realize that we have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. We have neglected to do good when it was in our power to do so. We have turned our backs on the poor, choosing instead to criminalize poverty. We have ignored the cries of the motherless, the fatherless, the widow, and the widower. We have consumed more than our share of the world's riches. We have not dealt honorably with our enemies and our friends. Forgive us, O oh God, for turning sackcloth and ashes into a fashion statement. Forgive us for hiding the light you have placed within us. As we begin the journey of these 40 days, wash us, O God, and we shall be clean. Cleanse us, O God, and we shall be made whole. Amen. O 
beloved children of God, hear this good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. All that is old within us has passed away, and indeed we are all new creations in Christ Jesus our Lord. As redeemed and reconciled members of the body of Christ, beloved children of God, we greet one another each week in worship with a sign of Christ's peace. So as you are able, I invite you to stand and greet one another with whatever sign of peace feels appropriate to this moment for you. The peace of Christ be with you. You may be seated. Our time for all ages this morning recalls for us a time before cell phones and smartphones and tablets and maybe even computers that you could watch things on streaming devices with and remembers a writer of children's poetry named Shel Silverstein. So if you are a teacher, or if you are a parent, or if you were even a child at one point, which I think many of us were, if we can remember that, you may have heard some of Shel Silverstein's poetry. And as we are in this season when we are practicing a Lent unplugged, perhaps this poem will give us a little bit of insight. It is the story of Jimmy Jett and his TV set. I'll tell you the story of Jimmy Jett, and you'll know what I say is true. He loved to watch his TV set almost as much as you do. He watched all day, he watched all night, and so he grew pale and lean. From the early show to the late, late show, and every show in between. He watched till his eyes were frozen wide, and his backside grew into his chair, his chin turned into a tuning dial and antenna grew out of his hair. His brains turned into TV tubes, his face turned into a screen. And buttons for changing the channel grew where his ears had been. He grew a power cord that looked like a tail. So we plugged in little Jim and now instead of watching TV, we all sit around and watch him. <laughs> As we give thanks to God for all the ways that we connect with our family and our friends and our communities through the gift of technology, we also remember that it is important to look one another in the eyes, to go outside and see the sky, to notice the clouds, to feel the earth beneath our feet, and that we are called to find balance between all of these things, today and throughout our lives. Amen. So as we prepare to take up the offering this morning and uh, go to a time for, um, go to uh, our, our moment for mission, um, you, you want to step up? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, Nancy Faulkner is going to share about a mission that we have in the month of March, okay? And then we're going to, you're going to follow Nancy, is that correct? Okay, you're going to start working your way out of that, okay? And the, this morning we began again like we uh, announced last week, we will be passing the offering plates. So um, right after this we'll give thanks to God and then we'll pass the offering plates.
<laughs> Here, hang on. Here, I got you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lila. Psalm, one, Psalm 150 says, Praise the Lord and praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens and praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for the surpassing greatness and praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise him with strings and pipes. And praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. God created us with the ability to sing and make music, and music is an integral part of our worship services. And we praise God through music every day. Now, although there is no mention of handbells by the psalmist, I might ask you how many of you enjoy hearing the handbells here at our church? Yeah, that's what I thought. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'd like to speak to you for a moment about our handbells and some of the care that they need. Some fun facts about our handbells are that they were purchased through a very loving and generous gift by an anonymous donor uh, several years ago. And the bells are used by your handbell choir. Um, they are made of, the bells that are used by your choir are made by, thank you, are made of brass. And they range in size and weight from very light to very heavy. <laughs> the largest bell is four pounds and ten inches. And the smallest one is just eight tenths eight-tenths of an ounce. As, as you have seen during our performances, we wear black gloves to handle the bells so that the oil from our skin does not damage them. We have tables with four-inch padding for positioning the bells, and also we use the table um, in dynamic arrangement by tapping them on the table. And we use music stands to hold our music sheets and our booklets. And all of these elements are necessary for the sound of the music and the timbre of the bell. Thomas has made a visual <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> oh, Thomas is showing you a visual <laughs> in the aisle <laughs> to show you the many intricate parts of each single bell. And if you can count them, which you probably can't from your sight of vision, um, there are 18 parts necessary to create a single bell. And we have 49 bells and 37 chimes that currently need our care. These bells must be cleaned and refurbished to keep them in good working condition and to deliver the sound you love to hear. The cost for shipping, handling, cleaning, and refurbishing these delicate instruments is approximately $3,000. So that is why, as a lifetime member of this handbell choir, I am asking for your assistance to make this refurbish refurbishment necessary. If you are willing to make a donation to continue our handbell ministry, we hopefully pray, uh, we pray that you will hopefully consider doing so. You can make your donation by indicating handbell on your check or attaching a note to the attached donation if you would do, if you would like to do so. We love bringing this beautiful music to you, and we appreciate your devotion and attention to the love of handbell music at Community Focus Church. Thank you. grade we had 14 kids in our high school and uh, at the end of the year we were having an assembly where the other 40 of us that were in elementary school came into the big auditorium and uh, listened to the junior talk about who was going to be their class officers for the coming year and being there were only 14 of them us little guys knew who they all were and I remember this morning one fella coming up to the microphone and said, hello, my name is Ronnie Bear. As if anybody didn't know who those kids were, he introduced them to us. Well, just you can see our numbers. Now, I would like this half of the room just to go, and if you don't do it, I'm going to be standing here until you do it. Okay, on the count of three. One, two, three. Very good, very good. All right. 
just half. Same thing. And if you don't do it, I'll be standing here until we get it right. Are you ready? Okay. Okay, we've all passed the audition. We have rehearsal this coming Wednesday at 5.30. <laughs> and believe it or not, we've got enough robes in the closet to fit everybody. Thank you. By the way, my name is Frank Fry. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Nancy. And one last moment for uh, the music uh, and worship team. Uh, during our table event and over the course of the next week, we'll be uh, hosting our first fundraiser for the music and worship committee, which is a March Music Madness bracket. Uh, Kelly, do you have that with you? I need, I need, can I borrow that? got Vanna White here to um, graciously show you. What we've done is select 40, uh, 64 of CPC's favorite Christmas, general, Lent, and praise band hymns here at the church. And uh, for $10, you can fill out this wonderful bracket. And each week, we'll have a paper copy to, for you all to vote on which hymns would you like to see move on to the next round, very similar to March Madness in the basketball world. Uh, this tournament will bring us right up until Easter. So on Easter, we should know who the final two are. So if you're interested in uh, taking part in this fun congregational fundraiser, we'll have somebody out at the tables after service, and you can sign up for that. Uh, if you don't, there you can still take part every week by filling out a survey for the folks who do get to fill it out. Well, you get to hold them over a barrel. Uh, for those three folks who uh, get the most amount of matches correct uh, for the bracket, they'll get to choose worship music of their choice for any Sunday that is not a major holiday. So the Music and Worship Committee wishes you the best of luck, and let the games begin. So all the ways that you support the uh, work of, of the church, we give you thanks. Let's go to God in prayer. Again, gracious God, we know that all our gifts, who we are, all that we have, come from you. So, holy God, we ask that you use all that we bring to you, for you, for you to use in the, in the spreading of your gospel of love, grace, mercy, and kindness. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Thank you, Sidi. So our first scripture reading comes to us from the book of Psalms. Psalm 43. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against ungodly nations. Rescue me from deceitful and wicked men. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning oppressed by the enemy? Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I will praise you with a harp, O God, my God. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Our first reading. Our second scripture reading comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. This follows immediately after the story where Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all of the kingdoms of the world and said to him, to you, I will give all of their glory and all of this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I will give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus said to him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will come and command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished every test, they departed from each other until an opportune time. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Your soul knows the shortest, safest route to your true destiny. So why is your ego behind the wheel? Anton St. Martin. So when we think of a person who is undernourished, a certain sort of image probably comes into our minds. Sunken eyes, skeletal frame, gaunt, and most of the time that is exactly what malnutrition looks like. Starvation, wasting away. Yet we live now in the 21st century in a time and place with an interesting paradox. The United States today has many people, an increasing number every day, who are suffering from malnutrition while also being significantly overweight or obese. 21st century America is full of lots of things that look great, smell delicious, and even taste amazing but they are not really helping to nourish our bodies. Physical junk food is not our only problem. There is also a lot of mental and spiritual junk filling our hearts and our minds. It comes to us in all kinds of ways, from all sorts of sources, all day, every day. 
which is why in this season, we are together experimenting and exploring the discipline of fasting, a diet for our spirits and our minds in this chaotic and anxious and distracting environment that we are immersed in every single day. We heard from our scriptures this morning that when Jesus began his public ministry, he began it with a fast. Newly baptized in the Jordan River, Jesus' spirit was wide open, totally receptive to the spirit's call and ready to follow wherever she would lead him. And the spirit brought him into the wilderness. Now, the wilderness, we know, if we have read stories of the ancient Hebrew people, is synonymous for this group at this time with reflection, with revelation that is brought about through hardship. The wilderness is the place where you go to strip away the ego. It is the place where you go to remember your spirit. Now, we all probably know a little bit about what our ego is. It is our self-awareness. It is our self-consciousness. And like many things in our modern world, through all of the things that we've talked about in the recent days and weeks, our technology, our connections in the virtual world, our screens, our computers, our smartphones, it is essential to us this ego that we possess, and it is not all bad. Ego serves a very important purpose in helping us to differentiate ourselves from everything else around us. Ego helps us to recognize ourselves as distinct from a rock on the ground or the chair that we're sitting in or our pet goldfish. But ego's job is to help us stay focused on ourselves and only ourselves, all of the time. Spirit, on the other hand, is in many ways ego's opposite. Spirit is our eternal self, our universal self, that essence that we have within us that connects us to everything else around us. It is our awareness that there actually is more than just me, that perhaps I am not the most important thing in the universe, or even the most important thing in the room. Because of spirit, we have empathy, and we have compassion, and we have connection to others. But often, in a world where ego thrives, spirit can get a little bit drowned out. In times of crisis, in times of panic, our egos have a field day, feasting on a buffet of self-absorption and of distraction. We find ourselves doom-scrolling or binge-watching or just happening to stroll onto Amazon or Etsy and click, click, click. We buy all kinds of things that we just don't need simply to make ourselves feel a little less vulnerable a little less afraid, a little less lost or helpless. Ego keeps us indifferent to the needs of others. It carefully wraps us up in our own concerns, our own biases, our own people that we feel comfortable around, and keeps us full on a steady diet of our own self-interest until we are safe and secure and well-insulated and completely unable to see face-to-face, the people who are right in front of us. We're unable to see the bigger picture of God's ultimate goodness and the fact that God is in control and caring for us in every single moment, even when the world around us feels like it is spinning out of control. The more we keep feeding ourselves an emotional and spiritual diet that does not nourish us, the more we begin to realize how completely empty we might feel inside. And that is where this idea of fasting comes in. And though it may seem counterintuitive to us at first to give up and to forego something in order to feel full, 
fasting is a time and place for clearing away of one kind of nourishment so that we can allow another kind of nourishment to thrive. Physical and spiritual fasting is all about making room, changing our focus. It reminds us of our limits, it reminds us of our humanity, and it reminds us of our relative unimportance in the great scheme of things. We are not the most important thing in the universe or even the room. We cannot rely and go through life living on the strength of our own power and skill and all that we have. Fasting breaks us down, but this breaking down is a very intentional destruction because it is one that enables us to rebuild and to heal, which is, after all, the purpose of this Lenten season. Friar Richard Rohr once said, true master teachers like Jesus are able to both deconstruct and reconstruct. But the only reason that someone like Jesus can tell us, yes, you are not the most important thing in the room, you are not the most important thing in the universe, is because Jesus also announces to us our infinite and unearned importance. That's right. I'll say it again. We are all infinitely and irrevocably important to God. Not because of anything that is within our power, not because of anything that we have done to deserve it, not because of our own possessions or strength or beauty or riches, but because God is good and loving and kind and sees fit to look upon us and call us precious. Maybe the reason that we have to be reminded of the first truth, that we are not the center of the universe, is because we no longer believe that second truth, that we are utterly and wholly precious and important in God's sight. We can no longer abide for our separate self, our ego, to be humiliated because we do not truly believe in the greater self, the spirit that which connects us all to each other and to God. We believe that our personality, our individuality, our self-image is all that we have. But Christ teaches us a different way. In this parable, we see on that mountain he was faced with mockery and temptation by an ego-driven adversary, but Jesus was not afraid to acknowledge his own limitations. Jesus was not afraid to encounter his own vulnerability. He was not afraid to show his humanity. And Jesus' goal was to help us see this critical importance of stripping away, clearing out all that stuff that fills us up so that the inner eternal essence of each one of us can be revealed Jesus was showing us a model for helping our spirit have room to grow and to connect with one another. And all this vulnerability, all this unguardedness that Jesus models in this story, it feels uncomfortable even as we just hear it or see it on the page. It's unsettling, it's scary, and it holds a valuable lesson for us. Unguarded space is where we transform. Letting go of our ego might make us feel powerless, but powerlessness is also the beginning of wisdom. We have to let go of one kind of power if we want to experience the other. We have to let go of our tendency to be insulated if we want to experience connection. We must fast so that we can thrive. Meister Eckhart once said, God is not found in our souls by adding anything, but by a process of subtraction. True spiritual wisdom reveals that less is actually more. So as we walk through this journey of Lent, 
and the journey that takes us beyond Lent in our lives, may we seek the wisdom of less, less distraction, less protection, and discover infinitely more connection, infinitely more spirit to spirit transformation today, tomorrow, and beyond. Amen. As we turn our hearts to come to the Lord's table this morning, let me call up a, a few prayer requests that came during the came up during the week. Um, let's remember the family of Richard Richard R. who passed away this week. He was in the hospital battling um, uh, COVID and a couple other things, and uh, he passed away this week. For Doug H., who was fighting cancer. For Steve A., who was facing medical challenges. And the Gideons, I spoke to them this past week, and they've asked that we lift them up during the month, during this month, if you remember them. They're, uh, during March, <clears throat> the, the week of March 25th to the 29th, they're going through the city to all the places where Bibles were taken out because of COVID. And they're putting in new Bibles there. So it's a big deal. Lots of bodies that are going to be involved with it. A big undertaking. They said, please, please remember to um, be lifting them up, lift, lifting up the Gideons. I visited Mr. Floyd this week, and uh, he's in good spirits and uh, continue to make some improvements there. We had a good conversation. And then also, let's remember Damon Lawrence, who's having some diabetic issues as well. This table is the Lord's table. It, the, the scriptures tell us in the book of Luke that people will come from, from, the, from the north and the south, the east and the west, from all over. And one translation says that they will dine and recline at this table. All are welcome into the presence of God. All are welcome. There's room at the table for everyone. So this morning, as we turn our hearts to join where heaven and earth meet, let's remember all those that are that are. Uh, either struggling with some surgery or recovering from some surgery and the families of those who passed away, those who are hurting. Today we will receive the elements passed to our pews in a way that we have not done in quite some time now. So just to refresh your memory, ushers will come forward. They will receive the elements at the table and they will bring them to you where you sit by passing first the bread down the rows and then the cup. And you will partake in your seat. We will all partake together. We also have a little bit of additional liturgy in our worship service for communion this morning. So as we prepare our hearts and minds as with the communion prayer of thanksgiving, please join with me in saying the opening sentences of our prayer that are printed in the insert in your bulletin. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Praise to you, O God, for all of your works. You created the world and called it good. You made us in your image to live together in love. You made covenant with us even when we turned from you. And you remain ever faithful. Therefore, with all creation, we sing together your praise. We thank you, O oh God, for sending your Son to live among us and tell your story. He healed the sick and welcomed sinners. He shared our pain and died our death, then rose to new life that we might live and all creation be restored. In the, 
we give you thanks for your boundless love revealed in Christ Jesus, and we break this bread and share this cup, giving ourselves to you to live for him in joy and praise. We remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread from the table at the dinner where he was eating in the upper room with his disciples, and he broke it before them, and he gave it to them. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And that we remember that he also took the cup from the table and he poured it out before them. And he handed it to each one of them and said, drink of this, all of you, for this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, poured out for all people for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. So we too, when we gather around this Lord's table, we take bread and we take the cup. We eat and we drink and we proclaim Christ's life, Christ's death, and Christ's resurrection until he comes again in glory. O oh, gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the blood and body of Christ, and that we may be this body in the world. By your Spirit, unite us with Christ and one another until we feast with him and all your saints in the eternal realm of justice and peace. We ask all of these things in the name of Christ Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will the communion servers please come forward?
beloved, the bread of life, and the cup of salvation. Gracious God, you fed our souls, our spirits, our minds, and our bodies this morning with the preaching of the word, with the singing of songs, and with the feeding at your table. So now use us, your common people, that are set apart for your use as we go and we celebrate your life that you've given to us. We give it back to the community around us. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. be prepared to join me in the, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 493 in your pew in your pew hymnal. Please stand as you are able and join with us in singing. We invite you to refrain from singing the second verse until the refrain. Uh, the choir would like to lift up the second verse for you. So we invite you to stand and sing with us.
beloved, as you go out into this week, into the Lenten season and into the waiting world, I invite you to first look to the people around you. Look at the person on your right, look at the person on your left, in front and behind. See them. See their smiles, their eyes, their beautiful spirits. And know that this is your community of faith, your family in Christ. You are not alone, and we are called to connect with one another in this moment, beyond this moment, and always. And may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, keep our minds and all of our hearts together in Christ Jesus today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you.